The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Apex The Five Second Rule. I'm your host, Sylvia Cuvedo. And yet again, another great episode with another great Apex superstar, Dr. Terry Redman. Uh, this episode is really going to focus on a an important document published. And, you know, I just got to put some dates on the episode uh, this month. APIC published a white paper entitled Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Recommendations for Balancing Patient Safety and Pandemic Response, a Call to Action. And uh, this important white paper published in February 2022 uh, is on the APIC website at APIC.org. It really outlines some important lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, create some recommendations and, and specific calls to action, not only for healthcare personnel, but uh, very importantly for our uh, legislators. Um, and so I, I really encourage all of you to download it. But to help us sort of understand a lot of what is included in this document, we've got Dr. Terry Redman, who's gonna, who's who's among the contributing authors, and is an all around important volunteer at APIC. Welcome, Dr. Terry Redman. Thank you for having me, Terry. I'm just going to share a little bit about you. You've done so much uh, in your career as an infection preventionist, as a public health official, but. Um, just so everyone knows, Dr. Terry Redman is a special assistant to the president, um, the director of the Institute for Biosecurity, and a professor of epidemiology in the St. Louis University College for Public Health and Social Justice. Um, she's a PhD nurse researcher, and uh, her research emphasis is in infectious disease emergency preparedness. Uh, in addition, she's a board certified infection prevention and uh, prevention and epidemiologist, and a fellow of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control, and uh, and she is a fellow of APIC. Um, so certainly well qualified to talk about infection prevention and control during a public health emergency. So thanks for joining us. Okay, I'm going to call you Terry because I know you as Terry. We've worked together on the APIC COVID nineteen task force. Talk to us a little bit about what you see the benefit of this white paper is for legislators and and for the public. Just sort of why should anybody read this? And then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Sure. So the white paper was intended to summarize all of the challenges that we experienced in infection prevention throughout the first two years of this pandemic, because of course, at the time of this recording, the pandemic is still ongoing. And the intent was to not only outline some of those gaps that we're seeing in infection prevention, but then also have some some actionable items to follow up on in terms of what can we do to make things better for the infection prevention and control community in order to improve patient safety and increase occupational safety for our healthcare personnel. Okay. And that... You know, I appreciate that because I think 
I think it is important to sort of say it is a it is a lengthy document with well, not too lengthy. You can certainly read it in less than an hour. But in terms as white papers go, there's a lot of content here. And, you know, we're recording this episode in May 2022. It was published in February 2022. And yeah, we've had two years of a, of a difficult public health emergency, a pandemic, and it's not over. And let's just be honest, there are a lot of organizations out there um, reflecting and and publishing various um, recommendations and lessons learned. But I think the the key thing here is the focus primarily on the infection preventionist and the infection prevention and control community, right? So there are a lot of themes here. Um, one thing that uh, I want to point out to our listeners, and, and again, it's, it's something that I think anybody who's been impacted by the pandemic, uh, everybody, um, should take a look at this. But let's just go through. There are a series of recommendations, again, for legislators and then the healthcare community, but it's broken down into approximately 11 chapters and and so we're not going to go through every single chapter, but I want to highlight key themes um, and then really ask you, Terry, where, if you had to, and I'm going to ask you to, you know, where we want to put most of our energy into. So first off, um, let's talk about the infection preventionist during this pandemic. So the person um, in charge of infection prevention and control. What do you see as the biggest lesson learned here in terms of the profession? Yeah, so infection preventionists reported a variety of experiences during the pandemic. The, The consistent experience was that infection preventionists were overwhelmed with work, that the pandemic simply... Um, There was so much of a burden on infection preventionists and on other healthcare personnel as well. But on that IP who is seen as the expert, they are the experts in infection prevention. So a lot of um, healthcare organizations came to their infection preventionist and needed a lot of assistance from them in to develop those COVID-19 protocols in order to make things more safe for healthcare. But what was interesting was that we found from various research and from talking to infection preventionists is that some organizations had their IPs very involved with their COVID response and others not so much. And when the infection preventionist was not involved in the COVID-19 response, then those protocols um, tended to be less evidence-based. The infection preventionist felt as though they weren't necessarily as safe or didn't follow um, local, regional, and federal guidelines as closely as those infection preventionists that were more actively involved. So they just felt as though if they were involved, their organization had a better response. And so one recommendation that came out of this is that it's really critical that healthcare organizations um, have an infection preventionist involved in their COVID-19 response, but of course, this actually goes way beyond COVID-19 in this pandemic. Like, this is not the first pandemic we've seen. This is not going to be the last pandemic that we're going to see. We have these outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases. We have natural disasters that occur that can lead to outbreaks of infectious diseases and increases in healthcare-associated infections. And so it's really critical that our infection preventionists, who again are experts in this field, that they are involved and to develop those protocols. So they need to be part of that emergency management team for our healthcare organizations and healthcare systems to make sure that we have um, evidence-based protocols. Uh, 100% agree. And that's one of the, uh, our raison d'etre for this podcast is to really showcase and elevate the infection preventionist as the expert and, and, What you just mentioned is woven throughout the paper and is repeated throughout the paper that the infection preventionist really needs to be part of that response and part of that planning. Um, I'll I'll say that. But let me ask you this, and this is just, you know, your opinion, given your experience throughout the last two years and certainly working with APIC on the research. 
Why do you think those facilities did not engage their infection preventionists? So some IPs, we actually, the APIC COVID-19 task force conducted focus groups, two sets of focus groups, actually, with, with IPs. And so we asked them what their experiences were. And this was one of those questions. How involved were you? Why were you involved or not involved? And some IPs that were not involved told us that oftentimes it was because they wanted to bring in the evidence to the protocols and they were, sometimes that makes it more challenging to have those more evidence-based, data-driven kinds of protocols. And so sometimes they were excluded from those conversations and not allowed to be part of that, that planning group. That sounds that crazy, crazy to me. I, I agree. It was, it was very um, difficult to hear those infection preventionists express those those feelings of frustration that they had at not being allowed a, a, t- a seat at the table when they are the experts and they simply wanted to make these safer protocols for their patients and for the healthcare employees and to be excluded was very um, hurtful to them and also just left them in a challenging situation. Yeah, yeah. hurtful to them, hurtful to the patient safety, hurtful to healthcare personnel safety. So. Um, I think that if anyone is out there reading um, this this paper, you'll see that theme. Um, not only to include the infection preventionists, but you know, and we'll we'll get into this more and more, um, Terry. But the importance of having a dedicated infection preventionist in certain settings. Do you want to, do you want to share some of, some of what's included there? Yeah. So one of the, in my opinion, one of the most critical findings that, that we talk about in this white paper was the lack of infection prevention expertise available within long-term care settings. And as we all know, long-term care is one of the highest risk settings in terms of a patient population that's at high risk from having severe um, disease from COVID-19 or getting hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. And even prior to the pandemic, long-term care facilities have struggled to have adequate resources for infection prevention. So oftentimes someone is assigned to infection prevention duties within a long-term care facility, but they're also wearing 10 other hats. And so infection prevention is just one piece of their job duties. And this really got highlighted during the pandemic when suddenly there was all this need for more COVID work and more COVID response, and the IP expertise just simply wasn't there. There was also a lot of turnover that was reported um, in long-term care in terms of infection prevention through the pandemic. In fact, um, one of the statistics that I had read said about half of all long-term care facilities had reported IP turnover during the course of the pandemic. And so it just meant that they they didn't have that IP expertise that they needed in order to respond and to protect those really vulnerable um, patients. And, and also the healthcare staff, the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually reported that nursing home staff were one of the deadliest occupations in 2020 simply because of COVID-19. So that is just devastating. Yeah. And we've had a couple of episodes um, on long-term care. And listen, and it's not for these individuals not wanting to do the right thing. It's not that they weren't caught um, also between a rock and a hard place. So that's not to beat the poor long-term care administrators and, and staff, but to just say, this is this is a great opportunity to showcase the importance of having a dedicated, qualified, certified infection prevention and control uh, person. And so so I think um, I, I, I think we can't say that enough and um, and we need to be prepared, as you said, this won't be the last. We're still under you know we're still dealing with it. Um, plenty of variants you know lining up. Um, so let me let me move on because you know I can go on and on, you know me. Um, let's talk a little bit about helping our listeners, understand and and just re-educate them on hierarchy of controls to prevent SARS-CoV transmission. That's a whole chapter in the paper. And, you know, just from, you know, day one of the pandemic to where we are now, can you shed some light on 
what we're doing around hierarchy of, of controls. And just let's remind everybody what that is. Sure. So as essentially, that is those are the mitigation strategies that we put in place to prevent transmission of disease. And this was has been a major challenge throughout the pandemic. And this is true for almost every outbreak of an emerging infectious disease. When we see these novel diseases that pop up, and this happens periodically, it takes a while to collect enough science to, to know exactly how this disease is transmitted and which um, prevention strategies are going to be the most critical in terms of how do we isolate these patients? What kind of personal protective equipment do we use? What kind of environmental decontamination strategies do we need? And so having that full picture of that science just simply takes some time. And as we've all experienced, and I'm sure we all remember this, even if you don't work in healthcare or you don't work in infection prevention, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that the science has changed over time and the messaging has changed over time. That creates a lot of challenges in healthcare and among the general public as that science changes, as we change our focus, as we know more, then we start to focus in on what are the most important control strategies. But that can be very challenging in a healthcare setting. It creates some confusion and sometimes even distrust from those healthcare personnel who are saying, well, wait a minute, like you're telling me this today, but last week you were saying this, and six months ago you were saying something completely different, and they start questioning um, the accuracy of that information. And they really just want to be able to protect themselves and protect their patients. And so they want to know the science, they want to do the right thing, but there can be a lot of confusion during a pandemic when that information is changing very rapidly. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. And there's a lot of that in the paper. And, you know, it's true. I I think I heard, I saw a quote listed in the paper about an infection preventionist who said, you know, early on, and I I saw this a little bit myself, um, people were walking around almost in a hazmat suit, right? They were so afraid. And then now there are people who are like, I don't even want to wear a little, you know, surgical mask. So we've gone, (laughs) we've come full circle. Um, But really, what we've tried to express on this show is by the time you get to a mask and a glove, you know, that's the lowest level of control from the perspective of you've really got to do more up front. Um, but like you said, it's it's a ever-changing landscape as we learn more. And I think people, I mean, I'll just say it, you know, um, the tolerance for that was limited. It's as if we just want one recommendation and and that that's just not how it is yeah it was it also created some challenges we saw a lot of challenges with personal protective equipment access to ppe um, inconsistent access to ppe and sort of circling back to what we were saying about long term care before one of the biggest challenges that we saw in long term care and, and other Um, non-acute care settings is that access to PPE simply wasn't there or certainly not there the same way it was for acute care settings. We also saw this in rural settings versus more urban settings where some settings just didn't have that access to PPE and so they didn't have that same level of protection for their healthcare personnel. And that created a lot of um, confusion, distrust, increases in occupational exposure and illness and and other challenges. Yeah, it kind of felt like the Hunger Games out there, you know. It was crazy. And there is a call to action for our policy leaders to address this issue of supply chain. And a really important recommendation, Terry, around respirators and universal um universally fitting respirators, That's correct? Correct. correct. And we do have an episode on um, airborne uh, transmission and respiratory illness, and I encourage you to go back and and learn about that, listeners. But, you know, we've talked about N95 respirators, which were an incredibly short supply during um, the early days of this global pandemic. And again, we're just talking pretty much in the United States of America, never mind what was going on globally. And this is still raging globally. Um, but N95 respirators, you know, historically are single use items. 
And here we are with a shortage. They have to be fit tested, meaning you can't just slap one on um, and have it be effective. It's a time-consuming process for occupational health, for infection prevention and control to fit test healthcare workers. Uh, they're not comfortable. I, you know, in my clinical um, background, I remember wearing them. They're not fun to wear, but they are important. So there's a lot of challenges with an N95. Talk to us about what a- APIC is recommending, Terry. Yeah, so there are a number of PPE-related recommendations that that APIC is making, and one of them is that we need to we need federal agencies to address our supply chain challenges. The supply chain, um, the weaknesses in our current supply chain led to a lot of PPE shortages. We also had some policy um, challenges early on in the pandemic where when there was a lot of demand for PPE among the general public and we didn't have enough access to PPE in healthcare, when consumers were purchasing PPE, then there was even less PPE available for the healthcare workers who were at significantly higher risk of exposure to COVID-19 compared to the average person in the general public. And so there are some policies that needed to be put in place to prioritize PPE for healthcare settings. There were also some policies that need to be put in place to make sure that we continue or we increase access to PPE in rural settings, in long-term care, and in some of those other high-risk areas so that all the PPE does not end up going only to the acute care settings. And then we need better universal PPE. So as you touched on with the fit testing issue with N95 respirators, um, one challenge that most people that don't work in healthcare wouldn't even, this wouldn't even occur to them. When we have those um, stockpiles of N95 respirators, or when you buy N95s from a different vendor, if your source for N95s is not able to supply adequate number of N95s to you and you get them from somewhere else, you have to refit test all those employees. And that is a huge time investment. And it just, it requires a lot of resources in order to do that. So a a better option or another option is to use reusable respiratory protection, um, such as um, a powered air purifying respirator, a PAPR, or a, a CAPR, or an elastomeric respirator, something that provides either equal or even better respiratory protection for those healthcare workers, but it can be cleaned and decontaminated between uses, so it's not a single-use item. And so that's an option. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, let's not forget... Um, better for the environment, ultimately, I think, when if we can move towards those. Um, yeah, I mean, that we could have five shows just on that topic alone. I say that about everything, but it's really true, everybody. So much to unpack here. So we've talked about the importance of a dedicated, uh, qualified, certified infection preventionist Uh, across the continuum of care, most especially in those settings where historically they haven't been long-term care. The other thing we, we touched on, and again, it's so important to read this paper, is the issue of supply chain. Everybody is aware of this now. If you weren't before, I, I don't even, I don't know where you're living, but the supply chain, the importance of access to adequate, uh, personal protective equipment. And by the way, we're talking about respirators, but there were issues with other uh, PPE, you know, adequate gowns, the right masks, gloves, eye protection, all PPE. The importance of, you know, the hierarchy of controls, the idea that, well, you want to remove um the 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 danger you want to um, manage space. I mean, we didn't even get into that. I know that the work of the practice guidance committee of APIC, looking at working with the facility guidelines institute, working with your healthcare engineers around creating spaces where you could put COVID nineteen patients, where you could have air, ex- you know, adequate air exchange. So. There's so much to unpack here, but I want to get to something else because we did an episode, I guess it was two months ago, 
on some of the unintended consequences of the global pandemic. At least in the United States, we started to see an uptick in some of those healthcare associated infections that we were really starting to get, you know, have great success in managing. COVID-19 hits and everyone um, is shifted. I shouldn't say everyone, but a large number of healthcare personnel, including infection preventionists, were deployed to manage the pandemic. And I, so I want to get into what the impact was of that. And that's covered in this paper as well. So we know, unfortunately, one of the uh, unintended consequences was this uptick in other healthcare associated infections. And, you know, we're having to circle back and say, okay, let's get back to the basics of infection prevention and control. But Terry, let's talk about what the impact was around surveillance, adequate surveillance of some of these other uh, infections. And that's a big part of what an infection preventionist does. And talk to us a little bit around vaccination, contact tracing, and some of the workload that shifted for our infection preventionists. That was a really long intro, but you know where I'm going. Um, So essentially, the the COVID-19 work, there was so much work related to just responding to the pandemic that our routine infection prevention practices often had to either be set aside Um, or they were delegated to other individuals who did not have that expertise that our infection preventionists have. And that that can work for some infection prevention and control activities. There are things that should be considered to be possibly delegated to other individuals. But some of that more specialized um, infection prevention work, for instance, surveillance, really needs to be conducted by a trained infection preventionist who has that area of expertise. Because our surveillance definitions are, they're complex and they're nuanced. It's not as simple as simply like counting, like in some ways, looking at our infection data for COVID-19 is relatively simple. You have tests, then they're either positive or they're negative. And I, I realize even that can be a little bit, it's not quite as black and white as I'm making that, but it's certainly much easier to identify if somebody has COVID-19 versus some of our healthcare associated infections, like our definitions for CLABSI or um, central line associated bloodstream infections, for instance, or our ventilator associated pneumonia um, surveillance. Those definitions are a little more challenging because it's a combination of clinical information and also um, just other, it's just more nuanced than straightforward blood um, COVID-19 tests. And I'll just, yeah, I I agree. But for someone listening who has, they're like, well, why is it so hard? You know, why if you have a bloodstream infection, tick, that counts as one. Because it's not just counting the infection, right? It's counting the time when it was, you know, it's, it's also, ca- you know, are they infectious? You know, so there's a lot there. Can you just do a little bit more 101 on that? <laughs> So, for instance, if you're looking at, let's say, a patient develops um, a bloodstream infection. So we know that they, the patient is sick. They have signs and symptoms of being ill. And we take a, a blood sample and we send that to the lab and it comes back with the list of pathogens that are plus, present in that, in that lab, in that blood sample. There are some organisms that we know are true pathogens and indicate like, this is obviously an infection, this is not right. And then there are others that could just be um, contamination, that the sample somehow got contaminated during collection of that sample. And an infection preventionist would know the difference between this organism is a pathogen, this one is a skin contaminant, and I'm not concerned about that. So that's one of those nuanced situations where if you don't have a trained infection preventionist, they simply see something grew in this blood sample that must be an infection. And that's not necessarily the case. There's also a timing issue. So if a patient, for instance, shows up in an emergency department and they're sick on arrival and they have an infection already in place, that it's not that the patient doesn't have an infection, they truly have an infection, but that isn't considered a healthcare associated infection unless they came from a long-term care setting 
in which case then it is an, it's a healthcare associated infection that might be tied to that long-term care setting, but not to that hospital. So you have to look at the date of onset of when the symptoms started or when that sample was collected to determine if something was an HAI. And so it is a more complex um, surveillance system than what we see in a public health setting, for instance, where they're simply looking at lab results to say, yes, they have this disease or no, they don't. And I think it is important. And I know, I mean, I've often said, not just in the, in the public health space, you know, people want easy answers sometimes to incredibly complex questions and therein lies the danger. So part of what Dr. Redman is saying is, you know, surveillance is something that it should be conducted by someone who's qualified because it not only helps you understand where the infection is coming from, again, it speaks to how can we prevent it? Where do we need to prevent it? What are the, what are the PPE? Who are the personnel involved? So that process is incredibly important and it's not um, a binary kind of thing. So thank you for indulging us with that. But again, let's get back to during the pandemic, you had people doing this work that maybe didn't have the proper education and training, correct? Correct. And so our surveillance data was either delayed in being collected, um, wasn't collected at all, may have been collected by someone who didn't have that expertise, and so it lacked some accuracy. And so what that meant was, well, one, we did not have real-time data about what was happening in our healthcare settings. So a hospital, for instance, may have had an outbreak of a certain healthcare-associated infection, but they they didn't know about it because the surveillance wasn't being conducted in real time, or it was being conducted, but they had inaccurate data. So, sorry, so I was gonna say, so um, there were studies that were done sort of retrospectively that found that there were significant increases in some of these healthcare associated infections that had been occurring that people just didn't recognize right away. And things got a little bit out of control as we were focusing on the COVID disaster, which was necessary, but we, we moved away from our standard infection prevention practices and then the HAIs increased. So that's a lesson learned. We can't take our eyes off of that, regardless of another pandemic. What is a recommendation for our lawmakers, Terry, on this? We need to have more dedicated resources for infection prevention to make sure that we have adequate trained infection preventionists in place during a pandemic. And so that they're able, that team or that individual is able to absorb that extra work of responding to the pandemic but also being able to continue to focus on those basic infection prevention practices to keep our healthcare associated infections and our occupational illnesses down. There's also discussion in that section of the paper about, you know, electronic health records and, you know, this even predates the global pandemic, the, the need to create, um, an EHR that, um, makes life easier for an infection preventionist as well in terms of data about, you know, the clinical and and surveillance definitions. Did I get that right? Yes. The, the surveillance process itself, um, in many regards, is a manual process, especially for um, reporting of that data. It's very time-consuming. We don't have great access to electronic resources to make that process easier. And so it takes not only a trained individual, but also dedicated time to be able to do that data entry and do that data analysis to see what's actually happening in your healthcare system. Yeah, I feel like that, I mean, I'll just say it. If you're an electronic health record company, um, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying like, come on, this, I feel like they can do so much now. You know, my smartphone seems to be able to, you know, read my mind. I don't understand why we can't, we can't create something that, that works for our infection prevention community and our epidemiology community. That's me. I just said that. Um, I think it's just about, you know, raising awareness and as they say, political will to do that. Cause I think the technology people out there are amazing and and could create something. Um, But maybe I'm simplifying things. I don't know. 
Um, so again, taking the infection preventionist maybe away from their surveillance duties, problematic. Um, talk to us a little bit about contact tracing and vaccination um, and what went on, lessons learned during the pandemic about the role of the IP. Yeah, so I'll start with contact tracing. So contact tracing is the, that process of doing a case investigation when someone tests positive for COVID-19 you talk to them about who they had close contact with so that we can then test those individuals and put them into quarantine if they haven't been vaccinated or they're not up to date on their vaccination. So that helps cut down on disease transmission. In a healthcare setting, contact tracing is extremely important if you have a patient that came to the healthcare um, setting and we didn't know that they had COVID-19 and we find out a few days later they test positive. So they've now exposed a number of healthcare personnel and other patients and, and potentially visitors to that disease. So the contact tracing process is really critical for um, limiting or even minimizing that disease transmission. Contact tracing, though, is a very time-consuming process, and it's very challenging in a healthcare setting because patients can move around from place to place and because we have different healthcare workers that work you know, each shift. And so it can be very challenging to trace back and find out everyone who was a close contact of that individual. And a lot of the contact tracing duties fell on infection preventionists um, in healthcare settings um, across the United States as it was reported. So for the public health, public health departments primarily were in charge of doing contact tracing, but within a hospital or a healthcare setting, it tended to fall onto those infection preventionists to do that work. And it took up so much of their time that they didn't have time to do surveillance and their other routine infection prevention duties because the contact tracing was so very time consuming. So one of the important um, recommendations that came out of this white paper was the recognition that yes, contact tracing is extremely important for healthcare settings, absolutely. And we still need to do contact tracing, especially for infected patients to see if they had exposed our healthcare personnel. But it doesn't need to be an infection preventionist that's doing that contact tracing. You can train um, another healthcare worker or even a non-healthcare worker on how to do that process and have them do that work so that you save that, that really critical time of that infection preventionist so they can focus on what they do best, which is infection prevention and control work. Yeah, great point. And in contrast to what we just talked about, the sort of uh, skilled intervention of surveillance versus something that, you know, frankly, I'll, hey, everybody, I actually took a course on how to be a contact tracer. So I'm an example of someone who's not an infection preventionist that could be trained, believe it or not, to do that. And so again, that's about resource allocation and, and understanding what the skilled services are versus um, something that could be delegated, certainly needing training, but can be delegated. Great point. Vaccination sites. We heard from our um, infection preventionists that many of them were deployed to manage vaccination, not just of healthcare personnel, but maybe local um, or community vaccination sites. Can you talk a little bit about what the paper outlines there? Sure. So, of course, COVID-19 vaccination has been one of our most important public health interventions to try to control this pandemic. And there have been a number of different strategies used once we had vaccine available to distribute that vaccine to the community as quickly as possible. Most places used either public health sites to do that vaccination distribution or local pharmacies or other kinds of community-based sites. But hospitals and healthcare systems and healthcare facilities also often were sites for vaccine administration. And infection preventionists were often pulled into that to assist with that vaccination clinic uh, management, not necessarily to give the vaccine, but to do some of that clinic management um, to help distribute those vaccines. And that is extremely important work, absolutely. But that, that running a vaccination clinic does not require infection prevention expertise. It can be done, it's done by public health professionals um, for the most part, it's also done by pharmacists and other healthcare workers and other groups of individuals, but it doesn't require infection preventionist expertise. So 
in my opinion, and, and those of the authors of the white paper, it's not the best use of an infection preventionist time to have them spend a lot of time setting up or managing a vaccination clinic. Again, they have this expertise in infection prevention and control, and they really need to have that time dedicated to focus on healthcare-associated infections and, and COVID-19 transmission within that hospital setting or healthcare setting versus the vaccine side. Great point. Again, this is all about managing the resources and understanding the unique knowledge and expertise of an infection preventionist and the importance of having them um, in your facility advising you, um, but not necessarily being pulled in directions that take away from their most uh, critical work. Gosh, I could just keep going, but we have a few more things to cover here, uh, Terry. Um, We haven't even gotten into cleaning disinfection and sterilization. We have a lot of episodes on that, but I do want to, I do want to cover what I think, okay, I'll just say it, the managing communications during a pandemic, right? We heard this across all health groups. The challenge on top of everything else was managing communications and combating misinformation and disinformation. So what does the paper say about that? What is the recommendation? So there there were a lot of challenges with communication that infection prevention has experienced. One, there was just the amount of information directed at infection preventionists. So they needed to collect all that information, distill that down, and then be able to communicate that out to community members. In in many ways, they had to formulate specific messages for each group because how you speak to, let's say, the individuals who work in environmental services is very different than how you would speak to your physicians and surgeons, for instance, at a hospital. So they had to have that ability to communicate all of that information. Um, in addition, the one of the biggest challenges that we heard from infection preventionists was combating misinformation. All those myths about COVID-19, about the pandemic, and more specifically about the vaccine created just so many challenges for infection preventionists. There was all of the false information available on the internet, false information in social media, that individuals would come to, and this included our healthcare workers, that there were healthcare personnel that would have the questions about the vaccine safety or, or effectiveness of the vaccine. And it required a lot of time on the infection preventionist part in order to really talk about the science behind safety and effectiveness of the vaccine and help individuals talk through their concerns So one Mm -hmm. thing that we heard really loudly from the infection preventionist was that when you have an individual who is hesitant about receiving the vaccine, that it, it, you can sort of move them towards accepting the vaccine. If you have a conversation with them, not necessarily the infection preventionist, it could also be a physician and infectious disease specialist, someone else, but someone with that expertise that can talk to that individual, hear their concerns, and then tell them the science behind this. And that has proven to be very effective in most settings, but it's very time consuming for the infection preventionist to do that if you have a large number of people that are hesitant about receiving the vaccine. And what we heard was that, um, especially infection preventionists in rural settings face this challenge even more so than those in urban and suburban settings, that in the rural settings, there was just more misinformation more distrust of the vaccine, um, more hesitance to receive that vaccine. And it resulted in really high COVID-19 rates and then individuals who were unvaccinated who became ill, who then required um, healthcare services, including hospitalization, stays in our intensive care units, time on a ventilator, and in some cases, um, death, of course. And In many ways, a lot of that was preventable if those individuals had been vaccinated. And so we heard from the infection preventionists was actually really heartbreaking that they knew the science behind the vaccine and they knew that it's not that the vaccine is 100% effective at preventing disease. We know that that's not the case, 
but it's very effective at preventing severe illness. And so you can reduce hospitalizations, you can reduce death if you get vaccinated. And so it was very challenging for those infection preventionists to know that a lot of that severe illness was actually preventable. And especially in those rural settings, those infection preventionists were sometimes interacting with their own community members, friends, family, yeah. like they knew those individuals. It was very difficult for them personally and professionally to be in that situation. Yeah. Um, we've, we've done a couple of episodes on vaccination and, you know, I am like the poster child for, I'll take any jab or shot that you want to give me, but but I do want to go back to not just communication around vaccination, but as you said earlier, the ever-evolving science and the need to communicate with the healthcare workers on, on the guidance, which early on felt like it changed hourly. I know that you all, uh, you and, and others with the APIC COVID-19 task force, we met, what, weekly? And it was a constant, okay, what's the recommendation for healthcare? What's the recommendation for the community? And those two often sort of bled together. So there was the need to, to communicate effectively um, and dispel some of the myths or the misunderstandings around who needed to do what when, right? Yeah, there was also what, what I heard a lot of infection preventionists say was, there was conflicting guidance. So the CDC would come out with their set of guidance. A local health department and a state health department might have slightly different guidelines. And so the infection preventionist was sort of caught in the middle of what, what protocols do we follow? Which set of guidelines do we follow? And then how do you justify that to your healthcare personnel when they're saying, well, I'm hearing the CDC says X and you're telling me to do Y. And then the infection preventionist is like, yes, that's because our local health department says that this is what we need to do. These are the resources we have available. And it, it just became very challenging for them. And with the constantly shifting guidelines, not just conflicting, but constantly, almost constantly changing, there was this distrust. And again, I, I sort of mentioned this before, the healthcare workers were saying, wait a minute, like last week you said to do this. Now you're saying to do this. And it, it just created a lot of um, confusion and challenges for those infection preventionists. So we're, we're, I mean, gosh, I could just keep going. There's so much here. Everybody really needs to read this paper. But Terry, I want to ask you, what would you like to see? I mean, of course, we, no one wants to see a glo another global pandemic, um, but we probably will. Um, this one is not over. We talk about COVID-19 is being endemic, but endemic doesn't mean benign either, right? So let me just ask you, what would you like the takeaway to be for everyone listening around? Um, obviously, read the paper. There's a lot of recommendations, but what would you like to see next time? Sadly, next time, but the next pandemic or epidemic. The next outbreak of emerging infectious disease. <laughs> yes. I would like to see more support from local, state, and federal agencies backing the science and helping to really dispel a lot of those myths and reducing that misinformation. Because unfortunately, if, if we have organizations that, that don't dispel those myths, then the general public and our healthcare personnel may, they will listen to, they do listen to social media and their friends and family, and they may not be hearing the actual science. And that leads to increased disease transmission, increased morbidity, increased mortality. And in a lot of cases it is, if not preventable, at least can be minimized if we do follow the science. So I would really like to see more support for the science moving forward with the acknowledgement that the science does shift. We collect more science. This is, that's the whole purpose of science. We collect more information, we learn more, and we change in response to that. But being more supportive of the science is what I would really like to see moving forward. Thank you for that. Oh, my God. So everyone, listen, 
Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Recommendations for Balancing Patient Safety and Pandemic Response, a call to action. This is available at www.apic.org slash Between a Rock and a Hard Place, March 2022. Dr. Terry Redman, can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your knowledge expertise. Thank you for the hard work you've done on the paper for APIC for keeping everybody safe in the St. Louis area and elsewhere. Again, everyone, thank you and we'll sign out. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audiotech is Blake Alfin. 